last week on the list in your boy. Let's talk about mixed match challenge. So uh, I want to ask you this. So now it's like what three weeks in? I think. Yeah. Three or you, four weeks. You hated the concept. You shit all I over did, the I concept. I didn't hate the yes, concept. Yes, you did. <laughs> mixed match madness is a dumbass idea. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You said it's trash. It. You said it's trash, and I don't care. The first tag team that's going to be in the mixed match challenge. Braun Strowman and Alexa Bliss. What do you think of that pairing? Who gives a shit? Yeah? Who gives a shit? I said I don't care, and I don't care. I don't give one shit about this. And if you all do, more power to you. <laughs> I said I shit all over it. WWE is in talks with Facebook uh, about producing a weekly show on a test run on Facebook Live, which is Facebook streaming service. Um, they're also looking at potentially doing a co-branded show featuring mixed tag team matches, and they trademark the, uh, the term WWE Mixed Match Challenge, which could be for that show. Dumb because idea. Mixed Match Madness is a dumbass idea. Okay, so you mean like, yeah, there, well, there's... Yeesh. It's The List and your boy with Jimmy Van and Sean Ross And we're live. <laughs> Good job, Nigel. And you know what I have to say? <laughs> that meme maker you hired is putting in overtime, right? <laughs> to be able to Photoshop all this fake, this, this fake stuff. I'm a victim of deep fakes, obviously. Right, deep right, fakes. right. This is clearly like the Simpsons episode when they showed Homer Simpson with the clock in the background going back and forth. You know what I'm talking about? Clearly that's what this was. You know what this was? This is called tremendous research and excellent video journalism and excellent video. Yeah, what video... you hired me for, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> what did you think of that, Sean? I think that, man, you've got just some incredible uh, tech guys there to be able to Photoshop all that stuff. <laughs> they Photoshop your knows, voice, Nigel too? Knows what's, Nigel knows what's up with the deep fakes. He works for Trig Tent. I know that he knows. They By the way, Nigel followed me on Twitter today. He followed me, too. Wow. I saw that. Yeah. Nigel, do you want to get your handle out on the air? Uh, I don't even know what it is. Is oh, it, come on. Is it at N Loki or Nigel Dash Loki? I, I'm, yes. I can look. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. You'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. So uh, I thought that was just an, an exceptional piece, and I kept it from you. We've had this for almost a week in the can, Sean. Hmm. And kept it from you, and we, we literally – so Sean isn't able to see the, the stuff live on the air. So we showed it to him literally three minutes before we went live. We sent him the video, and as soon as he was done watching the video, we started the live broadcast in order to get that out there. So, so uh, yeah, I, I do have the show up on a delay on a window. I have three monitors here. Got the Zordon set up over here. But, yeah, uh, I don't – I don't – I got to say um, I, I'm pretty – Pretty eloquent and well-spoken, <laughs> and that, that clip proves it. Yes, it does. <laughs> Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? Well, exactly. let's, let's, let's ask that. Who does? Who uh, does? I mean, what are they getting? Two million views a week, right? A little bit less than us, I think. Yes, a little bit less than us. Sure. Roughly less than us, yeah. yeah. I think they're doing all right. I think they're doing all What's right. up, you guys? It's Sean Ross Sapp. It is the list in your boy. February 14th edition, the Valentine's Day edition. What you doing for Valentine's Day, Jimmy? So let me tell you a story, Sean. Oh, boy. Can you tell me, and Nigel's uh, got a significant other, so I can ask you too. Can you tell me this morning, the moment that you said to your significant other, happy Valentine's Day, you know, gave him a kiss, whatever. What was that moment like for you this morning, Sean? It was... Roughly our 10th. We've spent some time apart uh, before we got engaged and all that stuff. But, you know, it was our our dating anniversary was just a couple weeks ago. So we, we never put that much stock into Valentine's Day, obviously. I'm okay. very lucky to have who I have. But, you know, it is what it is. Okay. And what about you, Nigel, this morning? How, how was the happy Valentine's Day moment for you? About uh, 5.30 a.m. over text because both of us had to get ready for work. There you go. So... So this morning, our little happy Valentine's Day moment 
took place while I was holding down my eight-month-old son because his entire back was covered in shit. Oh, my God. That was like how father, we... like son. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was actually pretty good. That was actually pretty good. But that was how we celebrated our Valentine's Day, cleaning up my son, who had an exploding poop. <laughs> and I said to my wife, isn't this apropos? I'm going to have to tell the story on the air. Isn't this apropos that this is what happened? Was it like projectile duty? Uh, so basically, when they have a when they have you know a solid you know incident like reptile from Mortal Kombat just was shit. Kind of. We're talking. Yeah. We're talking straight up the back, Sean. Oof. Because it looks for any 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 out in the diaper. Straight out right? the back. Like I'm almost impressed. Like gravity doesn't work that way. Well, when you're laying on your back in yeah, a crib, that's true. yeah, it does. Might have them. Might have your kid. Your house might be downhill in that, in that case. <laughs> no. If it just slides down. I, someone tells yeah, me this, he was probably sleeping in it for a little while. I imagine. And this uh, is our this is our uh, flagship wrestling podcast here, the list of you boy every Wednesday. What we talk about 3 p.m. Eastern. And one other thing I want to say quickly. So uh, on on Wednesdays, most of the time, I go to a coffee shop called the Second Cup. So you can see this is called Second Cup here. Today I go to the second cup. I'm telling my buddy Luke the Booker T story. The guy behind the counter who's been serving us every Wednesday for probably a year or two. Uh, matter of fact, the time that you were in town, Sean, we went to second cup and you went back to the office, right? That day. I believe so, yeah. Y'all wouldn't have me. Gentleman by the name of Mike. Turns out he's a massive wrestling fan and overheard us talking about Booker T and was suddenly all ingrained about what have you heard about John Cena and The Undertaker at WrestleMania. And so I said I was going to give him a shout out on this podcast too. So there you go. Yeah, shout out to him. Yep, for sure. Maybe he won't typecast me because I'm from Kentucky like a lot of the other waiters in Toronto. Typecast you? They recognize <laughs> you were from there. Yeah, that was actually very cool. That was – that's a story that I often tell people when they ask like, oh, how, how was that trip to Toronto? I'm like, well, let me tell you. That's right. Somebody sniped out my accent. That's from, right. They recognize. That was, that was pretty pretty incredible. So we're going to start off today by talking about a little story, and I'm going to admit – I had never really, I wasn't familiar with Powerbomb TV. Uh, I, I, I am not a user of this service. Uh, you released an exclusive story. So today is February 14th. You released it, I think, last night, right? Yes. Uh, and so why don't you go ahead and explain, you know, the facts, Sean, because I know that you're a little worried okay. about whatever. Explain the facts of the story that you heard. Yeah, uh, because I don't want to get implicated, subpoenaed, anything in, in that regard, because there's a lawsuit ongoing now. But uh, Michael Elgin had employed a wrestler who was accused of sexual assault last year and continued to book him after the accusations. And Elgin also had a relationship with the person who was the victim of the alleged sexual assault and had some pretty rude texts that were released via that person where he also trashed Jeff Cobb. He kind of trashed War Machine. That did not do him any favors with anybody. He was actually removed from several bookings and replaced with Jeff Cobb to add insult to injury. Uh, Powerbomb TV is a streaming service that kind of became the sweetheart of streaming services after Flow Slam died because they offered deals to people who had Flow Slam as well. So they picked up some some viewers and things like that that way. Uh, recently, Ian Rotten and IWA Mid South, who have reached a deal with Powerbomb TV to stream twice a month, had declared their intent to book Michael Elgin and run him on a show here. Now he's still been Elgin's still been working for New Japan. And that's gained a lot of criticism for New Japan, and they do have him contracted for for a lot of dates with them. Adam Lash, one of the co-founders of Powerbomb TV, had behind the scenes worked to not make this happen. I guess he didn't want to make this the catalyst of making it okay for Elgin to appear on the streaming service. Had pitched a couple ideas, like maybe they'd go to intermission on the service while he wrestled there, things like that. And he kind of said that maybe this was done – in spite of the accusations and things like that. So then Lash, after things didn't really go his way, went public with this and was fired from Powerbomb TV. He, cl he claims that they are denying him compensation, deny or says that they are uh, denying him ownership of something that, that he helped create. Meanwhile, Michael Elgin is filing a lawsuit, which Fightful exclusively reported, against the accuser, which she actually found out about via the Fightful story. So this is even more multifaceted. Uh, they had locked Adam Lash out of all their social media accounts, but he was still logged in and he retweeted a bunch of his tweets and stuff. 
and um, issued a lengthy comment to Fightful.com. I reached out to IWA Mid-South, which Ian Rotten runs, and they issued me a bit of a statement saying that <clears throat> they value Elgin as a wrestler over whatever issues that he may have outside the ring. He's going to be facing Manny Fernandez at an event now that, that will be streamed on Powerbomb TV. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you talking about, like, the Raging Bull Manny Fernandez? Yeah, probably. What? Le- the legendary Manny Fernandez, they said. Yeah. It's like 60 years old. Dude, I saw Ivan Koloff, I think, book in Portsmouth, Ohio, like maybe, what, 12 years ago? It was really, rough. Really, really? Oh, yeah, wow. it was rough. Wow. But uh, I got a comment from the uh, accuser, Elgin's accuser, which, you know, there, there's a, a multifaceted situation to that on its own, and we have an individual story up on that. All the links are on the Fightful.com story that we have, but um, <clears throat> the other owner of Powerbomb TV has since deleted his Twitter account and it's messy, man. It's really messy. And, you know, I kind of see a side for almost all parties and I see where all parties are wrong as well. Like Mm -hmm. this is a situation where there really are no winners again. Like how often have we had to say that I've covered a lot of sexual assault stuff recently and there are never any winners in the situation. And man, I mean, you let know, me, let me, got, let me just say this. You might end up getting subpoenaed over this because they, yeah. they had conversation with these people. It's it's messed up, man. I was asked by a couple of people on Twitter about, you know, what's the legality of this as far as Adam Lash's business partner changing the passwords and what's the legality of it? I don't know anything about their business uh, or about their, their deal together. I'm going to go ahead and assume that there's no paperwork, probably no shareholders agreement, probably nothing like that between them. That's just my, my assumption. And let me tell you something else. I'm fortunate that, that my business partner is also my friend, and so I don't, yeah. I don't have that worry that there's going to be that kind of a, of a problem between us. But if there was a problem between us, I'm not going to do a social media campaign about it. I mean, c- common, yeah. common sense 101 is you don't air your dirty laundry on social media when it comes to your business dealings. And so that was fucking stupid. Uh, but uh, you know what? I, I guess we'll see. I can't comment. I, I, this Michael Elgin thing, I mean, I guess the truth is going to come out after they investigate. We've talked before in the past about the whole Me Too movement and how people are assumed guilty until proven innocent. I'd rather wait until the investigation is done before anything is really said about it. Yeah, but, some, uh, some, of, some of Elgin's supporters aren't helping, helping him either. Like going on a smear campaign. Right. I had people that, without going into detail, contacted my family in an effort to discredit me because I wrote this story. Like, mm, mm. and you know, I don't want to get too much into that. Cause like I said, I don't want to be involved in this. It's I'm amazing. Story. This is the story. It's amazing how people get so sucked into the, the, the fictional characters of these pro wrestlers that they yeah. just believe them to be the superhero that they sometimes portray themselves to be on television. And like Enzo Amore, and again, not saying he was guilty or innocent because the investigation hasn't played out, but when that came out, all the Enzo Amore fans immediately accused the woman of being a liar because they're Enzo Amore fans. And yeah. that's, that's pro wrestling, I guess. That's how it is, right? It, the funniest thing is I'll, I'll see – and it's not funny. It's fucking gross, honestly. But I'll see people that are like, oh, well, they post provocative pictures. They're a slut. They can't be raped. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just kind of – countered your own point there by making that type of judgment right. and referring to them in that way saying oh they can't be raped uh, yeah i said it on the air yesterday if there was some like like if selling your nudes made you unrapeable you'd have a lot more people selling their nudes like if they, that was it's not not the way it works bad shit can happen to anybody would you sell and your nude sean yeah probably yeah probably i might anyway <laughs> Who's the highest bidder? Do you think there'd be would, would there be a market for that, Sean? You know, I don't know if you'd fire me over that. You'd probably use it as podcast fodder. You know I what? Don't... We could use new material for an online store if you want to think about it. Good. <laughs> like I'll cut you in for at least ten percent. You all can get those Sean Ross FAP videos. How about that? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> well, I guess we'll see how this whole thing plays out. Good on you for doing that exclusive last night, man. You did good work as always. And we'll see what comes out of it. Now, let's shift gears here and talk about Booker T and Corey Graves. Yeah, well, now, we need to kind of put ourselves over, Sean. Of course we do. Because, we well, I'll, fine, fine. But, but last week, so there's a lot of angry people this week, Sean. Yeah, there are. And, and for those of you that might have missed it, so Booker T, uh, I don't need to tell the story about how this started because I think everybody knows. But on his most recent podcast called Heated Conversations last weekend, he actually had Corey Graves on. 
and they revealed that the whole beef was a work. Uh, and Booker T, both of them were kind of laughing about it. Book said that he was actually happy that he was moved off of Raw, uh, and they were laughing about how uh, everybody picked up the story and rolled with it like it was factual, and they mentioned certain, certain publications and people by name. They mentioned USA Today, Forbes, Sports Illustrated, Taz, and Vince Russo by name, and Book questioned their decision to cover the story when there's so much real news going on in the world, and uh, Corey Graves was joking, saying that they worked the entire wrestling industry, with this whole thing, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that's what he said, and uh, and he, and Graves was Graves was shitting on the wrestling uh, journalists, saying uh, I didn't get a single phone call from anybody to clarify. Oh. When well, let's be honest about something: Corey Graves isn't going to take a phone call because WWE would be pissed if he did, right? Yeah, uh, hey Corey, hit me up with that email address. Hit me up with that right. fax address. I'll find a fax machine. <laughs> the PR won't allow that to happen. They won't allow it to happen. They don't allow it to happen. And no. the, the idea that. Outlets shouldn't cover things because there's more important. That is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. You know what? Just because Ronda Rousey debuts doesn't mean that I I can ignore a story about like Tony Nese if it's newsworthy. I can't do that just because one is on a level of fame of another or something like that. Also, it's wrestling media. They cover wrestling stories. Now, um... Les Moore actually brought this up. He messaged or he tweeted at Corey Graves. He's like, oh, yeah, where's your contact info? I'm sure a lot of people in the wrestling media would love to talk to you about this. There's no way – like he doesn't have a for bookings contact no. email no, no, no. Yeah. On, his, on his Twitter. Uh, his DMs are not open. There's no way that we as media can get a hold of him outside of sending him a tweet. Right. And then what? Then what? You're going to get quote tweeted and say – he got worked. Yeah. And, and you didn't know what? Work us, didn't work us. No, no, a lot of people are pissed off about it. And I, I've seen a lot of tweets from people that are really mad saying, you know, that, they're, that they work the wrestling business. You and I last week on the show, we both called it a work. And, and I said straight up that I did not think it was in Booker T's character. Booker T, even though, yes, he, he has a prison record and, yeah, he had a fight with Batista, that's not within his character to, to basically say, if I see you, I'm going to kick your ass. That's just not Booker T. And, and at so, this age. Like, well, I mean, he looks phenomenal. You saw him, they had video of that podcast, and he was wearing a, a sleeveless shirt, and he still looks really good. I'm, he could still kick Corey Graves' ass. Maybe. Oh, he could. Oh, don't he, even maybe. I, I don't know at that point. Oh, I, yes, he could. If he says he can't do a spin a Rooney anymore, right, right. I'm not that sure he's going to be able to beat anybody. Like, Well, I'm sure there, there's plenty of people whose asses he can kick. I'm just saying... I don't know what the man's got in him. Maybe it'd be a one-hitter quitter. Maybe it'd be a knockdown drag out. I don't I, know. I think if they were going to have a, a breakdancing competition, he'd have to be worried about not being able to do a spinner Rooney. No, I think he'd probably <laughs> actually win that one hands down. Oh, you think he would? At <laughs> yeah. 52 or whatever he, would, he is years old. He would adjust, yeah. I don't He'd know adjust. that Graves has any extended breakdancing background. Yeah, I don't know. I think, you, that, I think that Booker T has had to modify the spinner Rooney enough times that he would find a way to win that one. What did you think of my uh, YouTube thumbnail today? It was great. It was fantastic. Because he does have, Corey Graves does have a smug looking face. I created a thumbnail where I use Mini Me's body on Corey Graves' face. Because he does have a smug kind of Mini Me kind of, or, or, or Dr. Evil kind of face when he does, when he does uh, photo shoots and stuff, you know? But anyway, I, I personally was not offended or mad about it. I, I wasn't pissed off about it. I thought it was work from the nah. beginning. Uh, but a lot of we people even, were we even mentioned what the payoff was going to be. Yeah. A podcast appearance. That's right. all you can do. Right. So whatever. So uh, moving on. So uh, Ronda Rousey, she's going to sign with the robber in at the Elimination Chamber. What do you think? Cool. Why not? I, I saw one of our writers, Steve Muehlhausen, saying, oh, they should have put this on Raw. No. Do it. Sell, sell uh, network subs. Yep. I agree. I, uh, I have a theory, Sean. Do you? Go yes. ahead. Yes. Here's my theory. My theory is that her signing with the Raw brand means they're going to move ahead with something with Stephanie at WrestleMania, right? That's why she's on the Raw brand. My theory is that Nia Jax is going to beat Alexa Bliss at Elimination Chamber, or uh, beat uh, Asuka somehow at Elimination Chamber, uh, interject herself into the match at WrestleMania, and then Asuka is going to say, whoa, 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 I didn't say I wanted Alexa Bliss. I want Charlotte at WrestleMania. Yeah. That that will then give them a marquee matchup in Charlotte versus Asuka. Ronda Rousey will do something with Stephanie, and then it'll probably leave Nia Jax and Alexa in a in a in a match for the for the Raw Women's uh, Title. So that's my uh, that's my prediction. 
Fair prediction. I, I They've had to shuffle a lot of things. Jason Jordan got hurt. Samoa yep. Joe got hurt. Uh, the Ronda Rousey situation came up. So that's it's kind of fun. Also, uh, there there have been some pictures revealed uh, of Ronda Rousey doing pro wrestling training. Those are old photos. I'll have more on that on in this week's Fightful Wrestling Weekly that uh, hits Fightful.com Friday morning. But those are from around the time, I think maybe a little bit before, maybe a little bit after I broke the news that she was training as a pro wrestler. So there are some images out there whoa, of whoa. her in the ring. You broke the news, Sean? Yeah. You did? Me? I could have swore that like Wrestling Observer just kind of mentioned it and said, said anything about you. I don't I don't go about things like that, Jimmy. <laughs> Let me ask you about this rumor. So uh, uh, back to Ronda Rousey and, uh, and Stephanie McMahon. Mm-hmm. So the long rumor was that they wanted to Ronda Rousey and The Rock against Stephanie and Triple H at WrestleMania so long as The Rock can get cleared by the insurance provider. I've heard a rumor that if The Rock doesn't get clearance, they're going to interject Braun Strowman into that tag match. Have you heard about that? Yeah, it's, you know... Word on the streets. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? And pretty good. He's over. He's super over. Uh-huh. He's ready to be in that position. He's ready to be the guy. I would do it. Don't you think it'd make more sense if it was somebody like Kurt Angle? Or Shane McMahon, for that matter? No. I don't want Kurt Angle or Shane McMahon in that spot. No? I want way less Shane McMahon on my TV. But Kurt, though? You don't, you wouldn't want Kurt in that spot? No, I think Kurt and Seth Rollins is the way to go. You think so? Yeah, I do. I'm not feeling that match, man. I'm not. You will. You will when it steals the show. I guess. I will I will say this. Kudos to Seth Rollins for dropping the Bam Bam Bigelow gear on Raw this week. Kudos to him. I liked it. I wonder if he was in the back and he was like putting it on and then he looked at it and he was like, fuck this shit. This is, this is trash. <laughs> I wonder if that's what happened. Went to his gear bag and found his old tights from like two months ago and, and decided to go to those instead. I like the gear. It was different. The Bam Bam Bigelow gear? Yeah. Really? Cool. Coolest gear in the world. Because the whole burn it down thing is not him. It's dumb. You know? Yeah, sure. I guess there's a lot of this. Anna talked about it at length on last night's podcast. About what? And I, I posted a, a clip on our YouTube, fight or youtube.com slash Fightful about some of the character and identity issues with this and she's like yeah everybody's cutting a promo i want the championship yeah so does everybody else Mm. like that's the point why should i care that you want the championship more than this person like dolph ziggler it should be the point that's that's why she said like she's helping a lot of people in epw with their character and stuff as she's acted a long time and they'll bring up things and she'll be like no but you need to know the backstory of this character that way down the line you'll be able to feed into that and drop hints towards that and lend it some motivation. And a lot of these guys don't do it. And Seth Rollins has all that ready made. Mm-hmm. They just got to tap into it. And they, I think they have quite a bit lately. I think that maybe that's why I forget uh, pretty crappy gear or forgive pretty ca- crappy gear in that regard. Well, they've added them to the Elimination Chamber. So now it's going to have, uh, what, seven guys in it. Yeah, why seven? That's weird. So what they're doing, I guess they want to find a spot for everybody because like Balor's supposed to be an upper card guy, Rollins is supposed to be an upper card guy, so they're trying to find a spot. Now here's my question for you. Do you think that they're going to add another pod or do you think they're going to start with three guys? I think they'll start with three guys, which will make, so the Miz's, make the Miz's number one spot mean even less. Yes, and yeah, and, and I was thinking about that too because it's the same thing with the Royal Rumble. They always talk about who drew number one. Number yeah. two is the same thing. And in the elimination, it's the same, yeah, yeah, and Rey Mysterio's win is the most impressive ever right. in the Royal Rumble because, like, he lasted the longest amount of time from number two, and for a long time they didn't give it that that type of credit. I don't think, right, because it was the number two spot, and right. it should have, right. Just like, what what do you think of the the fast lane main event having five guys, elimination chamber having seven guys? Yeah, one month or maybe six weeks after Shinsuke Nakamura had to fight through 29 guys to get a title shot. How yep. stupid is that? Why yep. didn't he just wait? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like they're just afraid to go with somebody. You know, I mean, I, I know for years people have talked about the 50-50 booking, and I've, I've heard interviews with Hunter before where he calls that nonsense to the 50-50 booking, even though it's not nonsense. But it feels like that. They don't want to have to have to kind of focus on one guy and kind of put everybody else have him go over everybody else in order to get him to that spot. So they want to keep everybody protected. 
And this is what you end up with, a bunch of fatal five ways, four ways, seven ways, six ways, and it doesn't really do anything for anybody. Look at all the lazy-ass parallels between these shows. Uh, like uh, Absolution and Riot Squad, yeah. so lazy. The multi-man type of thing, both keep, keeping both of the women's champions off the show, like not wrestling for a long time. Mm-hmm. Neither one has defended their title in over two months. Mm-hmm. The, the weird lazy parallels are just – Gross mm-hmm. and stupid, and they had a they got a real chance. This is they did they did a lot of you know positive with the Royal Rumble. They let fan favorites, honest to God, fan favorites win the Royal Rumble, right. and not just like a Randy Orton one. At least it's not Roman Reigns type of deal, right? Like right. they let a couple of honest to God fan favorites win the Rumble. They debuted a huge star at the Royal Rumble. Mm-hmm. They they've got some good in ring wrestling. I think that some of the wrestling that's been on Raw and SmackDown lately has been exceptional. I yep. think the commentary has been much better in recent weeks outside of the dumb nicknames and all that. Mm-hmm. They've been plugging some of the holes in logic and things like that. Like mm-hmm. Tom Phillips bringing up, well, the only reason Dolph Ziggler came back is because he got a shot at the WWE title. Okay. I buy it. That's all I need to know. Uh, it doesn't work for me. Why, I mean, what do you need? Okay, so when you look at SmackDown last night, right? So, again, we're doing this on February 14th. So, SmackDown last night was on the 13th. They had an angle uh, in which a match broke out as a result of eating pancakes, right? That was yes. one thing. And by the way, pancakes are better than waffles. <laughs> You're a fucking moron. Pancakes are better uh, than waffles. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, You're pan- lying. There's no way you like pancakes more than waffles. Absolutely. Pancakes or waffles, Nigel? I got to go with pancakes. You all are. You all planned this. I do love no. waffles, though. I do love pancakes waffles. Pancakes are better than waffles, man. You can do a lot more with pancakes. And crepes technically fall under the pancake umbrella. They're part of the pancake family. What are you, French? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit traveled, Sean. Enough that I've had crepes. <laughs> They're just thin pancakes, you man. You Talladega Nights? Long time ago. I yeah. like really thin pancakes. <laughs> that guy. So anyway, so we had a match broke out because of eating pancakes on SmackDown. We had the progression of a feud based on a fake top ten list. That doesn't mean anything. Nobody cares about it. It's completely irrelevant, but they based an, they based a, a, an angle on it. They had the antagonist in that angle, who's uh, Jinder Mahal, use the list to shit on the other two because he mocked their ranking, even though he himself is not on the damn list. The whole thing is, is absurd. Then, uh, going back to Dolph Ziggler, and here's why saying he's, he's getting a title shot doesn't really work for me. When he left almost two months ago from SmackDown... He didn't leave because he was only the U.S. champion. He left because he said, I'm too good for you guys. You guys don't deserve me. That's why he left. He's had WWE title shots before. He's been the world champion. Yeah, but not WWE champion. I don't care. That's not, it's, it's just not good enough for me. And he's still pissed off. He still has a record scratch to start his music for some fucking reason. You, you know, know, I asked I asked Melissa and Lindsay in the chat if they prefer pancakes or waffles. What is it with you Canadians? Pancakes are better, man. You can ask the live chat right now. Ask the live chat. And anybody that, that posts on our YouTube or on our Twitter, go ahead. Pancakes or waffles, and I guarantee you pancakes is going to come out the winner. going to run a, a poll here. Do it. But I'm going to run a poll very soon. We'll, we'll, and we'll reveal the results next week. But panca- or waffles are just so much better. Wa- pancakes no. get soggy and just un- unedible. Meanwhile, Waffles are crisp and they have little syrup pockets in them. The texture's better. No, no. How long, are you, le- how long are you leaving them for? Yeah, yeah. You could do. You could, yeah, like unless you're unless you got the pancakes on the plate for 13 hours. Yeah, they're really yeah, they're, they're, that, that that isn't an issue. You can do so much more with the pancake than you can the waffle. There, there have to be some like special Canadian pancakes that I didn't have when I was there. You can't because... fold a waffle because you're breaking it in half if you try to fold it. Why are you, know you folding a waffle? Because you fold the pancakes. Why are you folding a pancake? Because you put stuff like Nutella inside of them, I've which never makes done it delicious. That. And, I, I put and strawberries and whipped cream. Yeah, that's fair. But uh, strawberries, yeah. But I've never put Nutella. I've never had Nutella. By the way, it's Nutella. It's not. No, it's not. It is. <laughs> Lies. It definitely is. No, it's not. Uh, all no, it's over not. the internet, by no, the way. No, no. Oh, you know what? Let's do an investigative intro on that. Do it. Do it. Because it's not. It's Nutella. It might. It might be. It might be Nutella in like you know Arkansas and and uh, in Kansas and shit. It's Nutella everywhere else. So go ahead and do it. So oh, let's. Yeah. So I gotta tell you this, man. I had a segue. I was about to set up. 
Oh, let's let's see a try. Go ahead. 30. My God. Go ahead. Let's hear it. I was talking about Ronda Rousey. We've had the fortune of talking to a couple other pretty big MMA stars, Heather Hardy and Chael Sonnen, about their interest in pro wrestling. Chael Sonnen we spoke to before his win over Rampage Jackson. Heather Hardy actually fights this Friday and kind of like casually revealed that a WWE Hall of Famer offered to train her. Take a listen. Um, you've you've crossed over from boxing to mixed martial arts. Um, I'll, I'll throw another sport out there for you, uh, you know, an entertainment sport, and that is uh, pro wrestling. Does that interest you at all, doing the pro wrestling stuff? It's funny because we have a pro wrestling team here at Gracie's, uh, at um, Gleason's. Um, Johnny Rods teaches uh, the wild world of wrestling. And, like, when I was in the amateurs, Johnny used to chase me around and say, knock off this box and fight and shit and come and train with me, you know. Like, I can make you money. I can make you money. And it's true, man. Them girls is making money. But I love to fight. I love to fight. Uh, do you still watch the WWE? And if so, is there sort of a favorite wrestler that stands out to you right now? Uh, you know, I, I like Chris Jericho just because he always changes his character and, and, and adapts it. You know, about every 12 months, he makes a little tweak. And at 47 years old, still keeps himself ex- extremely relevant. It's a hard thing to do. A lot of guys come out and they're a flash in the pan, even in MMA. And they don't understand <laughs> how to extend that career. Uh, they, they miss that psychological aspect of, of getting through the crowd. So I, I really admire him for that. I don't watch it very much. If there's a WrestleMania, I usually go to it live. If they come to Portland, I usually go live. But I don't sit down and watch uh, watch Monday nights, no. I imagine you watch Jericho's fight for New Japan, I take it. Yeah, I watched him take on Omega, man. I thought it was great on both parts. I thought Omega was great, too. It was, it was a good matchup. And uh, you do color commentary for Bellator, and I know that uh, you've also done some color commentary for wrestling back in the day. I believe it was uh, GFW back in 2015 with uh, Cyrus Freeze, who I actually know uh, quite well. Um, Any interest in doing that again? Yeah, Cyrus is a great dude, by the way. Good talent as well. Uh, Yeah, I I had a lot of fun doing that. That was with Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett was kind of my contact to that world, and he's right now stepped down a little bit, so... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'll do. I got asked to actually wrestle for Impact a few times, but uh, you know, I probably pr- prefer the the commentary gig. I'm not as big of a wrestling fan as sometimes I get made out to be. I was when I was a kid. Uh, I was into the Demolition, the greatest tag team ever, who the Road Warriors ripped off, and uh, that'll piss some people off, won't it? And uh, uh, you know, of course, Hulk Hogan and, and, and the Ultimate Warrior. So you know, I go all the way back to the '80s, but that's also kind of where I left it. Did you watch that 30 for 30 on Ric Flair? And if so, did you like it? Yeah, I, I did watch it. I was in it, as a matter of fact. I just had a real a real quick part in it. But uh, uh, I liked it a lot. I learned some stuff about him. Some of it I was a little disappointed with. You know, Flair, Flair was a bit of a wild man. and uh, uh, But he had a great career, and I, I really appreciated his candidness and, and giving us that insight. I thought it was a really good piece. All right. Man, James Lynch gets just interviews with everybody. I think he interviewed half the UFC roster last week. And as I was telling him on the air on our post show, he joined me for UFC 221. It's getting to the point to whenever David Tease writes a fight announcement article, he has a thumbnail ready from one of the fighters that is competing because James has already interviewed them right, for us. Right. So that's that's pretty cool to have. And uh, guys, just a heads up, if you are an MMA fan – my UFC post show is Sunday night. UFC is running Sunday instead of Saturday. So I, I had planned on Saturday night. Now, pushing it back a night. But I, I want to ask you while we while we had MMA people, hmm? what do you make of UFC running WrestleMania weekend? Because usually they have steered way clear of that. And they are going head-to-head with Supercard of Honor, which they have no idea what that is. Mm-hmm. But uh, NXT TakeOver, too. That is – I'm going to pull it off. But that is uh, that's going to be the busiest night in fightful history. We got NXT Takeover, Supercard of Honor with Cody versus Omega, a yeah. pretty big match, and UFC with Habib versus Tony Ferguson. And Conor McGregor is probably going to be in the house for that because his buddy Artem Lobov is on the show. Mm-hmm. That is a psycho, psycho weekend. I think that WWE, from WWE's position, they don't care. Mania sells itself at this point. They don't care. I think well, this you- is Takeover, but. No, I know, but you said the same weekend. You know, yeah. like I, I just don't think they care, and uh, I think UFC. Uh, you've, I, I'm sure you've seen their numbers. I know I've seen their numbers. They, uh, they got to pay back some loan, Sean. Yeah, you know they sure saying? do. So I guess we're doing what they got to do, and they don't have a whole lot in terms of main event level stuff. This is their best shot at getting like a popping a buy rate for 2018. So yeah, meaning they got Rose and Joanna their rematch up on that too. They they right. stacked the deck on that show. Right. Right. So. Uh, 
I kind of posted like a little bit of a guide of how I'm how I'm going to do it. I'm going to cover we're going to have NXT. I'll cover that immediately after. I will finish up the UFC show. I'll do a live podcast right after that and James Lynch is probably going to be there covering it live. Oh, cool. So so uh and Joe will be covering Titan, so I'll probably try to bring on a special guest if I – and otherwise I'll do it so, solo. Then I'll catch up on Ring of Honor, do a post show on that. We're going to have shows all weekend. Even awesome. our buddy Matt Riddle's got a show that weekend. I heard about that. I heard about that. I saw the article too that he, that he talked about the marijuana usage. It's very interesting. Yeah, what do you make of that? Uh, I think that he, uh, he's got a, a good grip on reality, I think. So in case anybody missed it, I forget who it was with Vice.com, I think. Yes. And he basically acknowledged uh, that the marijuana usage, you know, could be a bit of a problem with WWE. He said, if they offer me enough money, I'd quit. But uh, he's, he's, he basically seems to, he's happy where he's at. He said, I'm making six figures. I pick my own dates and I get to use my marijuana. So sometimes I, he uh, picks his own dates twice. Yes. He does, have, he, he does. He does. So, Sean, let me tell you, man. So, you know, that, you know, I've become a really big fan of Elias. And from the time that they debuted him on Raw, he was one of the guys I always would kind of put over because I, and I always use the word presence because he's got that, right? He's yeah. got a presence. Uh, although Rusev and Lana on the Mixed Match Challenge was freaking awesome too. But that's, that's another story. But that was, Rusev is awesome. Who gives a shit about <laughs> Mixed Match Matt? Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> it's a dumbass idea. But, uh, so I love Elias and, and, and he's, he's got the crowd, even when he's shitting on them, they cheer for him anyway because they recognize he's good. And there's Elias in the ring, and uh, JoJo says, ladies and gentlemen, Braun Strowman, and they cut to a different spotlight, and the first thought in my mind was, oh my God, they're going to make him sing. That was the first thought that came to my mind, and I was thinking, are they going to fuck up Braun Strowman by having him sing? What they presented was brilliant, I thought. And Nigel, I know Nigel's a musician, and so he's going to understand this. Braun Strowman, who I'm, do you know who Braun Strowman is? You guys talk about him a lot. So he's a ginormous human being. He's probably 6'9", 6'10", 320 pounds maybe. Uh, he sat at a microphone, and instead of picking up a guitar, he picked up a double bass. That's awesome. And he held the double bass like a guitar, and I was waiting to see what are they going to do with this, and what did they do? The first time he went to play the strings, because he's known to break shit, first time he went to, bro- to play the strings, he broke all the strings. That's awesome. And I thought, <laughs> that is amazing, amazing. Uh, and then he finished the spot by uh, by actually br- using the, the the double bass, breaking it over Elias's back, which was a phenomenal looking spot too. Yeah, it was. Uh, and I've I've said this before, and I'll say it again: the British Bulldogs running power slam. I'm not sure they could have picked a better finisher for Braun Strowman than that. Remember when he was doing the reverse choke slam at first? Yeah. And I hated it because guys could prepare for the for the for the bump, and it just didn't look good. The British Bulldogs running power slam is a perfect move for him. It's something that he can hit anytime, anywhere. It looks devastating the way he does it. Nobody has ever gotten that move over like Braun Strowman has. Yeah, I mean the Bulldog obviously did, but but I don't I don't think it was that over, man. Watch, I, I, uh, go back and watch WrestleMania Seven. Okay, maybe. He had the and warlord. Maybe. He had the warlord up, and you know when the Bulldog used to get them up, and then for a split second he would let go with both hands. Yeah. Imagine the, the warlord. How, how often? Weekly, this crowd is begging him to come back. Yeah, but it's, it's a different time. It's a different time and a that's, different crowd, right? But, uh, but he's doing a great job. And I've, I feel like I've said this a hundred times, and I'm going to say it again. Um, Braun is the guy. And at WWE, if they haven't recognized it, they're going to have to recognize it, not just because of the crowd reaction, but because of the little things Braun does. And yeah. the, other, the other day, actually, I was reading Pat Patterson's book. Pat, yeah. Pat, Pat Patterson tells a story in the book about how Shawn Michaels came to him one day and he said, when I felt like I reached the next level is when you, Pat Patterson, told me, listen to the crowd and feed off the crowd, right? Braun Strowman is worlds ahead of Roman Reigns, worlds ahead of Roman Reigns when it comes to listening to the crowd, feeding off the crowd and playing off the crowd. He's worlds ahead of them in that. And he does it constantly. He's listening to them. He looks at them. At the house shows after his matches, he tears off his shirt and he gives it to a little kid in the front row. He knows the little elements that Roman Reigns just doesn't get. Plus, he's got a sense of humor. You can put him on The Tonight Show, and not only would Braun Strowman get over because of his physical appearance, he's got a sense of humor, too. He's a clever dude. And with all due respect to Roman Reigns, I respect his, his, his work. I respect the schedule that he's kept. He's been full-time for many years, and that's tough on anybody. Braun, in my opinion, has surpassed him, and he is the guy. And it's up to WWE to recognize it and pull the trigger on it. He's ready, man. 
Yeah, and as I've mentioned, it doesn't hurt that they've they've booked him as being clever too. He doesn't get yep. outsmarted a lot. Yep. It's the old Road Warriors way of booking. Like even though they're big brutes doesn't mean that they're getting outsmarted all the time. So mm-hmm. when he does, it will mean something. Hopefully. Right. As long as they let it mean something. He's he's good, man. He is. And and, and again, good. it's it's one thing for them to say to him, Okay, here's what you're gonna do. We're gonna give you a double base, you're gonna go out, you're gonna you know, then you're gonna chase Elias to the ring, he's gonna run out, you're gonna hit him with it. They could tell anybody that. It's how yeah. you it's how you execute it, and the guy he's got that part down. And and again, I don't want to shit on Roman Reigns, but just watching him read the crowd and play off the crowd, Roman doesn't do that, man. He just doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't. And it's it's an important element in the game, I think. In so. my opinion, I mean, he's thirty four right now. You pull the trigger on him now, you get a lot of good time out of him. Right. And look at it this way: Beth Phoenix, WWE Hall of Famer, is thirty seven right now. So and she was phenomenal. Uh, and Trish is like forty three. Yeah. So I mean, like. Yeah. You, not everybody has these long, long, long careers. And Braun, for better or for worse, he's a big dude, but he doesn't have to bump a lot. So maybe that will help him. Maybe it'll hurt him. Right. I don't know. But if they keep him yeah. going the way he is in terms of the physical aspect of it, he could go to mid forties easy. easy. Oh yeah, well, that's 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 the thing these days. People mm-hmm. are wrestling later mm-hmm. than ever. Yep, for sure. Yep. So let me ask you about this one, man, because there's been a lot of speculation back and forth on this. So uh, I don't know. There, there's a Twitter account called WrestleVotes, and I don't know if they broke the story. You'll probably know. I don't know if they broke the story or not. I do know that Ticketmaster sent out an email to anybody that bought tickets for the Backlash pay-per-view on May 6th uh, at the Prudential Center in New Jersey, and they informed those ticket holders that the Backlash pay-per-view is going to be dual-branded. Uh, it's going to feature talent from both Raw and SmackDown. That led to speculation that that's going to be the first show that goes back to being dual branded and that every pay-per-view is going to be dual branded. But then there's also been speculation that they're actually going to do the, the next draft on that show and that the pay-per-views won't be dual branded, but that everybody has to be there for that one because it's going to be the draft. So what's what have you heard? I've talked to some WWE talent. WWE PR did not respond to my request, but... Uh, the talent I've talked to said that they have been given zero indication about what's going to happen moving forward. So they don't know yet, but this is the same company that doesn't often let people know where they're going until the moment they're either drafted. There were people right. in NXT who had no idea they were getting called up. And I'm like, man, I- I'm all for getting genuine reactions and stuff, but it's a TV show. Yeah. Let these people get their lives in order. You're right. You're right. And I, and I got to say this, and if, if they do do this draft, and if Vince McMahon gets the idea in his head that, well, you know, Roman's getting overshadowed by Braun, so I'm going to move Braun to SmackDown. Mm-hmm. If you do that, you're a fucking moron. All right? Leave him where he is because he's, he's right now probably the biggest guy in the company, uh, literally and figuratively. So uh, yes. don't be an idiot. Leave him on the raw brand. That's where he belongs. Yeah, and I mean, I could see them wanting to anchor him as the SmackDown guy and making him run things, but in my opinion, he is something fresh for Raw. I would, however, move a Seth Rollins over to SmackDown. They need another big top babyface that people care about because Randy Orton isn't that. Uh, you could make you could make Rusev that guy, but I think that you need another guy that has been there, that has done that right. that top guy thing. Right. And I still think the Shield Triple Threat is a mania main event somewhere down the line, even though they blew it. Mm-hmm. And I think that down the line they could have like maybe Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose or the the Raw WrestleMania main event or something. But Seth Rollins has won the Rumble on SmackDown. He's like, no, no, no. I want to be a part of this. Yeah, they could, yeah. Yeah, and he doesn't even have to win it. He can go right back to SmackDown afterwards. You don't have to compromise – I would also move. Shows. I'd move Bray Wyatt over to SmackDown too, and I would. I'd pull the trigger on the Wyatt family reunion. I would too. Yeah. And then, then I would find a way to like they've got a lot of Haas tag teams right now. There have never been more talented big man tag teams right. than right now. And there's no excuse for their tag divisions to be so weird. Right. I liked Anna's point that Benjamin and Gable hate all the comedy tag teams, and that's kind of their mission. Mm. I like that, but. They also don't like pancakes, so you and them have that in common. <laughs> I can relate. I, I don't dislike pancakes, but waffles are way better. They're really not. They're really not. Although you're probably used to Eggos. So, uh, those aren't bad. What's wrong with those? My friend... What? I got I to gotta fill up a goddamn waffle iron to, to enjoy them? Uh, they're better, Sean. Oh, my God. I used to uh, back in You know, in Aunt, Jemima, Aunt Jemima makes frozen pancakes, too. You can put in the toaster if you want. 
Yeah, I ain't into that. I used to make my own at uh, Moorhead State University when I went to school there. They had like the waffle iron and. So just so you know, Nigel was just like laughing and nodding because uh-huh. first first you put over egos, but then he said, "Oh no, I can't have the frozen pancakes. <laughs> can't do that." Well, because pancakes aren't as good as waffles. Oh, that's why. I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> so here we are another week, man. <laughs> do it again, Sean. Do it again. Do it again. I'm good. No, do it again. We no. need enough for a clip so we can make a meme and put it on Twitter. I'm not one of your trained to trig tent monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there. <laughs> here, here we are another week and I'm putting over John Cena and I can't believe it, man. Another week and I'm yeah. putting over John Cena. So my friend Crazy K, who you've met... He, uh, he hit me up yesterday, February 13th, to, to inform me, and I went and, double, and, and checked it at the time. At the time that he hit me up yesterday, a story about John Cena was the number one story on Reddit. And I'm not talking the Reddit pro wrestling group. I'm yeah. talking reddit.com. A John Cena story was number one on Reddit. Uh, it was a clip from Raw this week when Cena, after he beat uh, The Miz, he went to ringside and he uh, hugged a kid in a wheelchair in the front row. Uh, and that clip was, was number one on Reddit. Uh, we know that he, uh, in 2015, he became the first celebrity to grant 500 wishes for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So kudos to him on that. And I got to give him props for the Nickelodeon spot, man. Did you see that? Back-to-back years. No, did you see the, the promo? No, I didn't. Have you seen The Nutty Professor? I have. Eddie yeah. Murphy's Nutty Professor. Have you seen the scene where uh, it's around the dinner table and he plays everybody in the family? Yeah, of course. Nickelodeon did that with John Cena. Oh wow! I think and, I liked it even more when they when Tropic Thunder spoofed it with Jack Black playing everybody. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, the tape. <laughs> yes, that, yes, that is one of the greatest <laughs> comedy films of all time. It doesn't get the respect it deserves. Well, Nickelodeon did did a promo, and that was what they uh, emulated. It was the whole John Cena family or the Cena family sitting around the table. They had such names as Don Cena, that was his dad, and Don and Don Cena was wearing a T-shirt that basically said, "I loved Wayne Johnson," his dad. Uh, yeah. his, his mom's name was Mom Cena. His sister's name was Joan Cena. His brother's name was Sean Cena. Oh. And it was very, very well done, I thought. Very well done. So good for him on that one. We got a hot race in this pancake waffle deal. Pancake's going to right win. Now. Pancake's going to win. It's it's tight. Like 50-48 pancakes after waffles took an early lead. Okay, are there only like three votes and one of them is you and another one is your wife? No, there are... <laughs> 132 votes right now. There's already 132 votes Whoa. for this thing? Yeah. Really? We're popular, Jimmy. I need some I need some pancake lovers to like and and again I want to I want to you know say this again, crepes or pancakes people. You know, if you like, if you had, like huh? I I've never had crepes and I'm trying to lay off the carbs right now, but cuz I it just I I but I got to try crepes. They're, I got to try crepes. They're excellent. I'm going to give them a, I'm going to give them a go. I actually like crepes better than pancakes, but they're all under the pancake umbrella, so. It's because you're French. That's why. Vander Linden's a very French name, Nigel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I want to ask you about this rumor, Sean. Uh, okay. I'm, all, I'm all about asking you about rumors this week, man, because I want to see if Sean can debunk some rumors for me. Yeah, so, okay. That's what I'm here for. On February 11th, it was reported by a guy named Gary Stonehouse for the UK Sun that WWE is looking to have Bill Goldberg appear at WrestleMania and compete in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Uh, Now, obviously, we know that I think Mania is on the 8th this year, April 8th. On April 10th, HBO is going to be debuting the documentary by Bill Simmons about Andre the Giant. And so there's speculation that WWE is going to want to put a little bit of extra shine on the Andre the Giant Battle Royal this year. And it would make sense. Goldberg's going in the Hall of Fame. He's going to be there anyway. Yeah. Put him in the Andre the Giant Battle Royal, probably have him win it. Uh, do you think that's something, I mean, to me, it, it makes sense, but have you heard about that? Uh, that being it makes sense. I've heard about the rumor. I reached out about it and I was told that, uh, it would take a lot of money to get him to do that. Well, sure. And it was 250 yes. a match, right? Yes. And for, for that spot that they probably wouldn't be interested in, now, this is somebody who works in WWE and they said that they hadn't heard anything about it and they're usually pretty plugged into storyline changes. But they said that a lot of other things come together, especially with that match in like days and weeks before it happens. Uh, they said that very rarely do they know who's going to win that Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal until the day it happens. Hmm. Because you never know who will be injured. You never know who WWE will want to call up. Hmm. A, lot of, a lot of things you could do with that. But I would be, I would be very surprised if Goldberg were in that. It's not like the winner means anything. 
you know? No. Mojo, Mojo won it last year. He hasn't done shit. Uh, Baron Corbin won it, and he's a scrub. I mean, they, they, nothing's really come out of that battle royal. I wish, and, and you could. You could. I thought that Mark Henry should have won it as his swan song. He still could. He still could. Yeah, he could. Yeah. He could, but make it mean something. Yeah. I always thought, and I'm going to do a fightful book sit on Drew McIntyre. I think there's, like, Drew McIntyre debuting after he's been injured for a while and winning that. I would have that guy almost be like obsessed with trying to impress Vince McMahon on screen because he was once the chosen one. Yes. And he failed in that role. I'd have him bring back the old music and just be obsessed with becoming the guy almost to a fault. And maybe he has like a shining performance there. There are, there are so many ready-made story. You got so many people in the match. Uh -huh. You can make a story out of it, but right. they never seem to. Uh, I thought that debuting Baron Corbin in it was a fair thing to do, but what has he done since then? Oh, he's a bum. Well, to be fair, last night was the best night of his WWE main roster career. I yeah. thought that he looked pretty good in the ring and uh, got cheered, but he wasn't. Was he supposed to get cheered? I don't know. I don't know. I don't see money in him. I've said it from the start. I don't see money in him. And and again, I respect these guys for what they do, and I respect the schedules they keep. They're home five days a week. I respect what he does. I just don't see money in him. That's it. Here's the thing that Pat just fed to me, uh, our new weekday editor. Hogan asked for 750k from New Japan. Uh, he he asked for it. Do do what? That that's Hogan's Dufois? price. Yeah. Yeah. You know why? It's because he doesn't need the money anymore. Yeah. That's why. Multiple let's go to, settlements. Yeah. Let's go to stupid people. This is a stupid song. It just goes on and on. You might find some meaning, but you would be wrong. Okay, so uh, I hope I'm not ca catching you off guard, Nigel. I want you to put a little graphic up on the screen for me. Oh, sure. This is uh, obviously our video uh, watchers are going to be able to see this, or audio listeners are not. This is uh, a, a little addition to Stupid People for this week. It's from uh, Danny R., who's one of our listeners. He sent us the screenshot on Twitter. It's from the WWE Mayhem mobile game produced by Reliance Games for Android and iOS. And this is what Danny R. said. Since the last update on the W Mayhem game, they started using only nicknames. It's ridiculous. In this screenshot, they show Luke Gallows in the background. In the foreground, they show Triple H, and then there's like a word bubble because it's what Triple H is saying. And what Triple H is supposedly saying is, quote, the suntan biker man is dying to meet you. <laughs> wow. Now, I got to be honest, Sean. I had to Google the suntan biker man. Yeah, because I imagine. I've, I've never heard that on WWE television, and it turns out that I guess he was sometimes referenced by that name uh, in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and there's actually a couple of Pinterest sites where he's referenced by that name, the Suntan Biker Man. The only thing I can possibly think is that the makers of this game, Reliance Games, they were so desperate to get nicknames for everybody because that was probably the mandate. And they, yes. were so, and they were so desperate, they probably Googled Luke Gallo's name, and they probably came across Suntan Biker Man, so they put it in the game. Yeah, I would, I would say so. That's, Isn't that that's embarrassing? Where we're at. Isn't that amazing? That it's, it's embarrassing. It is embarrassing. It is. it is embarrassing. It is. It makes you not want to be a wrestling fan when you hear shit like that. Yeah, it's dorky as shit, man. Yeah, like, it is. It is. And how is that? How is he intimidating if he's going to go out there and say, the Suntan Biker Man <laughs> is going to challenge you? I mean, Nigel's fucking laughing sitting over here. <laughs> It's so ridiculous. All right, let's go to uh, to the stupid people questions here, or stupid people stories. Once again, TrevorStrong.org, thanks for the usage of the song. These are good. This first one was actually told me by my buddy Luke at lunchtime today. Oh, sweet. And so I looked it up, and uh, it was reported by ABC affiliate WTVD out of Raleigh, North Carolina on February 12th. This is good, Sean. This is good. There's a man out of Chesterfield, North Carolina named Duncan Robb. And yeah. before Christmas, he uh, was online, uh, you know, looking up tickets and stuff. And he came across tickets for a Red Hot Chili Peppers concert in Belfast, Ireland uh, on February 10th. Okay. And he thought, this is perfect. He's half Irish and he visits Belfast pretty regularly. The, the Peppers are his girlfriend's favorite band. And he thought, February 10th, we can turn this into like a Valentine's Day trip. So it's perfect. Yes. So he goes ahead and he, and he scoops up the tickets, gives her the tickets on Christmas Day. They're stoked. They're really excited. They book their flights to Belfast. They head over to Belfast, Ireland. At the last minute, they, they give a better look to the tickets. And it's actually a bagpipe band called the Red Hot Chili Pipers. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my 
my god uh, that is phenomenal yeah so they, they uh, yes they did oh that's excellent yeah they thought you know what we're here now and they they actually got a bit of a chuckle out of it they thought we're here now and he actually was quoted by abc as saying yeah i kind of i kind of wondered why the tickets were so reasonably priced <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are expensive. I was going to go to uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers concert earlier this year, and I did not. Well, but if you had gone to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers, it would have been cheap, bud. I should have. So. I should have pivoted. I should have pivoted. <laughs> that's what happened. Yep. So I thought that sort of was awesome. Good. That's, that's one of the better ones I think we've had. This next one, this was reported by ArkansasOnline.com on February 11. This, one, this one's good, too. So last summer... There was a 23-year-old woman named Autumn Royanne Partington, and she was working at a restaurant in Hot Springs, Arkansas. She was a waitress. One of her customers paid for the tab with a credit card. She was gone for an unusually long time uh, charging the card before she came back, and here's your receipt, and here's your credit card. Then the, uh, the person who owned that credit card discovered some online purchases showing up on his, on his, on his uh, statement. I thought, that's kind of weird. Um, police were, were, were involved. The woman admitted any wrongdoing because the guy figured she had this card for a while kind of thing. She admitted it. She, she wouldn't admit any wrongdoing. The online stores, when they were contacting, they had her address as being the delivery address. They had her email and her phone number attached to it. So then she fled the area. A warrant was issued for her arrest. She fled the area. And, uh, and it kind of went cold for five months. That, was, that was last August. Last month, which would have been January, this woman posted a photo of herself on her Instagram page. The caption underneath it said, I love my job. She was wearing an apron, and the apron featured the name of her new employer in a place called Cabot, Arkansas. Somebody spotted the, the Instagram photo, spotted the logo on the apron, called the police. Police went there, and they arrested her. And uh, she was charged with uh, felony theft of receiving a credit debit card and two misdemeanor counts of fraudulent use of a credit debit card. If it's easier than ever to get caught doing dumb shit. I watch a lot of investigation discovery and I'm like, man, you could have got away with anything in the 80s. It's true. My I mean, God. When, when you shit on Mixed Match Challenge, I was able to catch you on that real quick when you denied it. <laughs> Well, so. I mean, especially when you've got a tech team that will put together a bunch of falsehoods. Yes, that's what they did. This is going to be the headline story on TradeTent.com, this conspiracy oh, yeah. that I'm facing <laughs> right now. So, so if only you, I knew a guy who could get that up there. Are you suggesting that we created a set that looked like your, your office there, and I actually hired a guy that looked and sounded like you to sit in the chair and say these fallacies? Is that yeah, your suggestion? Yeah, completely unlike you on this show to pretend to be here when you're not. I would never do such a thing. You would, but I would never do such a thing. Yeah, but I wasn't the one who brought this video up. It was it was investigative uh, journalism. I'm busy in the sewers. I feel, I feel like the list, our listeners deserve the truth, Sean. Our listeners deserve the truth. Yeah, which right? Ninja Turtles movie is the best? Because I tried to watch the 2007 digital one. Nigel, do you know which one I'm talking about? I think so, yeah. Made it through about a minute and a half. I only mm. I only remember the very first one from whenever that was. The it's good. Late 80s or the 90s? The live action one? The live action one. Yeah, that's yeah. the one I remember. Corey Feldman, two, Corey Feldman was one of the voices I remember. Oh, yeah. First two uh, were pretty good. Yeah. All right, this last story. We got one more. This was sent in by listener Andrew Monahan. This is for the Sean Ross Sap file. Ah, oh, yeah. And this one was reported by the Daily Mail in the UK, although I will admit that I saw this story everywhere. Uh, so it was out there. Uh, and I know you're going to know immediately what it is, Sean. Nigel may or may not, but I know you will. So uh, Super Bowl took place recently. Yes, it did. The Philadelphia Eagles defeated the New, H and P New England oh, yeah. Patriots. And it's really amazing how something like a football game can turn a city of civilized, educated people and turn them into mindless... Whoa, we're talking about Philly? <laughs> <laughs> you can go... You can, okay. Uh, the, <laughs> the words expressed by Sean Ross Sapp do not necessarily reflect those of myself or Fightful.com. <laughs> we put that up there when I would tweet on behalf of Fightful.com. There you go. On, on one wrestling. So, like I was saying... A football game has the ability to turn a city of civilized, educated people into mindless, stupid monkeys. And so when the Eagles won, 
the city of Philadelphia went apeshit. People were climbing poles, even though they had put grease on them because they didn't want them climbing poles. They were still climbing poles. Uh, people stood on the awning at the Ritz-Carlton and made it collapse. And the Daily Mail posted a video of an Eagles fan. And of course, he was being encouraged by all of these very jubilant, excited, and probably intoxicated uh, football fans. He was being encouraged. Peer pressure is a thing, Sean. This man got down on his hands and knees at the encouragement of these people. And he ate horse shit that had been left on the street by a police horse. Ugh. What? He got on his hands no. and knees, and Everybody. he and he did it almost like, you know, like pie eating contest style, where you, <laughs> you put your arms back, and you go in head first. Bobbing for horse shit? He did it like you that. You have a new eating competition. Yeah, yeah. With Jay's <laughs> this year. What do you think that would cost? Uh, yeah, just a couple of... Philly natives. That's it. I got oh, to grab some of the way up. No cost there, to you at all. There is video that shows this guy going down face first, coming up, and he's got basically a nugget in his mouth. Ugh. Oh, yeah. Looking up. And, of course, the whole crowd erupts because they're all idiots, so they all erupt. <laughs> and that happened, and there is video footage of it. I saw, it would probably cost you more to get the poop from poopsenders.com. I should get them for a sponsor. I've given them a couple shout outs. I mean, I could just, uh, you know, follow my cat around for a day or two. We're good to go. Yeah, but I mean, that that would get eaten real quick, I would imagine. <laughs> We're talking about Philly here. Philadelphia. <laughs> the words expressed by Sean Ross Sapp. The words expressed by Sean Ross Sapp do not necessarily reflect those of myself or Fightful.com. Hey, we don't romanticize everything from Philadelphia like PW Insider does, okay? Oh. <laughs> let's go ahead and let's talk about the Woo Compromise. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? Who sings the stupid song? I said that already, man. I don't think you did. Yes, I did. Nigel, did I or didn't I? Yeah, you said that. Yeah, I did. Just checking. Maybe if you actually paid attention to your own damn show, you would have heard that the first time. It would help. <laughs> So, are you familiar with the Woo Compromise? The Boo Compromise? Oh, the Woo Compromise. The Woo Compromise? I, yeah, I sure am. So, I'm sure Nigel is not. And uh, you you and I both know, Sean, that I've got a, a good friend, a mutual good friend of Ric Flair. I haven't hit him up yet about this one, but I'm going to. So, um, Ric Flair, this past week, and I'm sure he was probably egged on by somebody. He was encouraged by somebody to do it, wanted to make a few bucks. He actually put something for sale on his website. He called it the Woo Compromise. It was an autographed document. And it's basically a consent form that they would encourage people to sign before they have sexual relations. Called it the Woo Compromise. Had a picture of Ric Flair on it and said Woo Compromise across the top. 50 bucks he was charging for a piece of paper called the Woo Compromise with his signature on it. WWE got wind of it and they basically told him, take it off your Twitter page. Uh, he did and then they ended up taking it out of the store as well. Probably a good call. Yeah. Especially when it's Ric Flair. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So because had had he been a had social media been around back then? Yes, he would have gotten the, the old Hulk Hogan boot the hell out of the wrestling industry uh, with the quickness, running around on airplanes with his dick hanging out. Yep, and 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 you know it it, it tells you about how the wrestling business was. I saw an interview recently uh, with Missy Hyatt. And Missy Hyatt, somehow Ric Flair came up in conversation. She talked about how she has seen Ric Flair's penis. And I don't think they ever had sexual relations. Jeez. She just said, I, I just, because he would, he would whip it out. She said, I've seen his penis hundreds of times. And think about it. Like you said, 30 years ago, if there is Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, yeah, Ric Flair is blackballed. But 30 years ago, that's how, that was the mindset, man. It was accepted, right? And that's what he did. So. My God. What do you think oh about... Maybe, maybe uh, we can sell bootleg ones <laughs> in the store. What do you think about... Uh, are you talking about his penis or the Woo Compromise? <laughs> Either. Whichever sells. You want to sell... The, you, I'm here for Fightful's bottom dollar. That's what I'm, uh, I'm here for. Also, speaking of Fightful's bottom dollar, you guys can head over to ProWrestlingTees.com slash Fightful right now and get the brand spanking new... I don't even have one yet. Fightful Mania t-shirt, it is up. We have, uh, you're only going to be able to get the You Have Opinionated Wrongfully shirt for a little while longer. We're taking that one down. It might not be there, so you better go get it now. We still have a Ya Boy shirt. We have the classic Fightful tee that you see on guys like Jason Kincaid, Matt Riddle. Jason Kincaid, 
back in the Fightful Fold, by the way. If you all have not checked out his articles, they are unbelievable. I'm sure one day he'll be like, hey, you know, maybe I could compile this for a book. So uh, you all should definitely check that out. But ProWrestlingTees.com slash Fightful. Got to order my shirt. What do you think about Rey Mysterio uh, taking a match against Jushin Thunder Liger at the uh, New Japan show Strong Style Evolved, March 25, Long Beach, California? What do you think of that? Savvy. Yeah. Capitalizing on all that buzz that he's got. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. New Japan had sold out the show before even announcing it. Yeah, isn't it like 8,000 seats? Something like that? I think it's like 4,500. I'd okay. have to check. Okay. But they could have done 10,000 based on this trend. Right. It would, the funny thing is Cody Rhodes, I think, made a bet with Meltzer that, that Ring of Honor wouldn't do 10,000. Well, and that's why they're doing the all-in show. Right. I'm not, I'm not convinced that, that maybe they won't now, and depending on who's there and what's going on. But to have the ticket sold out and then announce Rey Mysterio, mm -hmm. hey, good on, good on New Japan for recognizing the buzz that Rey Mysterio has as well. He looked great in the Rumble. Yeah, he did. And speaking of buzz, uh, you remember back in the early 2000s, New Japan had a dojo in L.A., and it was run by Antonio Inoki and Samini Inoki at the time. Uh, you want to hear a funny story about that real quick? Yeah. In Daniel Bryan's book, he reveals that when he stayed at the New Japan Dojo, his two roommates were none other than Shinsuke Nakamura and Lyoto Machida. Yes, I knew Eventual that. UFC light heavyweight champion. Right. Uh, Daniel Bryan spoke English. Nakamura spoke Japanese. Machida spoke Portuguese. And he said that Nakamura and Machida spoke just enough English to not like each other. Right. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, man, you want to talk about a competitive household right yep. there. Yeah. And I can see Shinsuke Nakamura and Lyoto Machida not getting along. I can see it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they were both at the at the time very early and they were to be MMA fighters, too, because right. Nakamura fought a couple times. Right. So yep. what a what a just a house full of talent. Yeah, well, they shut down that dojo 10 years ago after uh, Simon Inoki resigned as the president of New Japan. Now, obviously, we're seeing a resurgence with New Japan Pro Wrestling in the U.S., so they announced that they're bringing the dojo back uh, in March, and I, I remember, I forget the date, it might be February 13th or 18th or something is when applications, uh, you, could, you could submit applications to be part of it. Yeah. So, good on them. I mean, they're recognizing it again. I mean, they're getting a lot of their stuff televised live on Access TV now. The whole Ring of Honor uh, uh, relationship has been phenomenal for them. And uh, and I think it's helping WWE too. I think yeah. that is bringing a lot of a lot of uh, hardcore wrestling fans in. So good for them, man. Really wish my catch wrestling coach and former tag team partner opponent Jay Grooms would do that thing because I, I heard that and I'm like that's ready made for him. The the idea of charging for camps like like recruitment camps essentially is a little odd, but I mean. There are some places like Monster Factory makes uh, probably a killing off of it. They do very well for theirs. And slapping that New Japan name on there, mm -hmm. if, it, if it helps you out and people want to do it, then why not? Do you think they're going to go the old school route and they're going to have like young boys and they're going to, you know how uh, Antonio Inoki would give guys a big slap in the face? That won't happen. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's considered misconduct this day and age. Yes, it is. Right? So I want to ask you this, Sean. Anybody that's familiar with MMA will understand this reference. Bellator MMA is kind of like, almost like the comedy sideshow of MMA to a degree. Yes. Because even though they have their own really solid, elite level talent, they always focus on uh, guys that used to be stars. They always focus on guys like Fedor and Rampage Jackson and Tito Ortiz and guys that had any kind of name recognition that they could kind of capitalize on to try to pop a television rating. It comes, it sounds to me, and tell me if you think I'm right or wrong, and I realize they're coming from nothing, so at least this is something. To me, the NWA is turning into the Bellator Pro Wrestling. Yeah. And, and I look at it like, so they announced last Sunday, they did their championship wrestling from Hollywood tapings last Sunday. Um, Nick Aldis, who is currently the NWA champion, Magnus, formerly Magnus, he issued an open challenge to anyone who was either a world champion or had beaten a world champion. And that, that brought out his next challenger for the NWA World Championship, James Ellsworth. How great is it that we have him in studio? We have him in studio, yeah, James Ellsworth. And I thought to myself, James Ellsworth, when he left WWE, prior to leaving WWE, he was wrestling women on television. When he left WWE, he posted a mock list of people that he wanted to wrestle, which was kind of a spinoff of Cody Rose's yeah. list. And it was all women on James Ellsworth's list. He's living up to it because on March 30th in Altoona, Pennsylvania, he's going to be wrestling Emma 
uh, AKA Tennille Dashwood. Uh, new Ring a, of Honor signee. New Ring of Honor signee, yep. He's going to be wrestling her at a big time wrestling show. So here's a guy that was wrestling women in WWE. He's going to continue wrestling women on the independents. And because the NWA is trying so hard to grasp onto anybody with name recognition, they're making James Ellsworth the next challenger for the NWA world title. What do you think about that? About uh, I like it. I love it. Yeah? What's more of it? Hmm. Albus is going to beat him. Yeah. That's just what they're doing. And if he's available, he's got a little bit of buzz. He's fresh off a WWE run. Yeah. Why not? What harm can it do? Did you what see? Harm the, can it do? Did you see the visual of the face-off with those two guys in the ring? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, he just Ellsworth just wrestled Austin Aries or with Austin Aries and uh, Pete Dunn a yeah. couple weeks ago. So I mean, he's been in some stuff too. Yeah, but he looked like in the ring. He looked like a fan asking for an autograph. That's the point. Uh, That's the point. And then he takes a sucker punch and I think they're runs reaching. away. I think they're reaching, man. I don't. I think it's great. Uh, I don't know if I'm feeling it. Uh, and now one last thing here before we get to, uh, we can do some listener questions unless you want to get to your other thing first. But I want to ask you about Jason Jordan. Uh, so Kurt Angle announced on Raw that he's going to miss WrestleMania. Do you think it's a work? And do you think that Jason Jordan is going to do a run-in and cost Kurt Angle or Seth Rollins a match at WrestleMania? It's hard to say because WWE is playing their injury stuff closer to the vest than I've ever seen them do like with the Dean Ambrose thing. And with this there and Braun Strowman last year, they're trying their best to work people to, to surprise people. And I understand that that's fine. It's their right to do so. Mm-hmm. But last year they kept a lot of people off WrestleMania. They kept Finn Balor and Samoa Joe off WrestleMania when they could have had them on the show mm-hmm. in some capacity. Seth Rollins got hurt and we didn't know until like what the week before if he was going to be on WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. And they said it was a non-sanctioned fight type of thing. They're playing it really close to the vest, as they should. I'll make a prediction, an uneducated prediction, that yes, I think he will, because I think that is going to be a hot feud moving forward, and I love Jason Jordan. Are you talking enough of them. hot feud Jordan-Seth or Jordan-Kurt? Yeah, Jordan-Seth. Jordan-Seth. Well, and probably one of them gets moved over. I, I think Seth Rollins needs to move to SmackDown. I think he is a guy that they could really help if they want to. Mm-hmm. Man, him and AJ... Mm-hmm. On that show, I would move like we talked about. I would move Seth. I would move Bray. I would also move Charlotte back to Raw because she is just not the same since I moved over. I'd move her back to Raw. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. I would. I would even consider moving like a Nia Jax over to SmackDown. I, I would move a Bailey or a Sasha Banks because Bailey otherwise could use you're it. never. Otherwise, you're never going to end that feud. Yep. Afterwards, it'll be the Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens things. Those two will always be associated with one another unless you split them up. The thing with Owens and Zayn is. That was almost the entertainment factor was that Kevin Owens was like, finally, I'm getting away from this guy. And uh-huh. then that guy got drafted with him and uh-huh. he hasn't been able to get away from him still. Uh, two people that also won't be getting away from each other. The married couple of Braxton Suter and Allie. And we often talk about identity in pro wrestling and nicknames and things like that. These two had to change their identities upon uh, entering Impact Wrestling. Braxton Suter was known as Pepper Parks. But I think Allie, as Cherry Bomb, had more of a name among hardcore indie fans and had had gained that following. I talked to them recently about changing their identities for Impact. Take a listen. You both had established names and personalities for, for years before this. What was it like making the transition to having completely new names and identities with Impact Wrestling? Um, I will be honest. It was difficult. <laughs> It was um, it was a challenge because um, there are parts of the character of Cherry Bomb that I really identified with, and I mean I've been wrestling now for gosh thirteen almost fourteen years, and Cherry Bomb has been my name since I started since I was eighteen. So um, to have that identity for such a long time, and then to walk into a new company and have that identity sort of taken away and been given something else was difficult. It was hard. Um, but I learned very quickly, um, that this was an opportunity for me to explore, um, myself as a performer, um, as a talent, I was able to sort of, you know, it's, it's not every day that you're handed a new slate and, um, and have to perform a different way and then have a long story and then have a payoff. 
Um, so I've been like really blessed and fortunate to have that story with Maria and, and all those things. But initially, it was really, really hard to let go of, of Cherry Bob. I mean, she's still in my heart. She's still there. <laughs> but it was definitely, it was a challenge at first, for sure. I kind of like, uh, well, we, we always we always joke that like everybody in wrestling has three names. You have your, you have your real <laughs> name, you have your name from the indies, and then you have your TV name. So it, it's like, you know, they all kind of get like mishmashed. And then sometimes there's four because then sometimes people have like a nickname too. But like for, I don't know, for me, it wasn't that bad because luckily for me, it's like I didn't, it wasn't really much of like a gimmick change. You know, it's like I was, I was Pepper Parks on the Indies and then they changed it to Braxton Sutter. You know, it's, it's not like I went from a gimmick of being a postman and then I went to a gimmick of now I, um, uh, I don't know. No, I was in like a tag team and we, I don't know, work construction or something. I don't know. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like a big drastic change. So like, you know, the, the, uh, the like you know, the name thing, I just kind of, you know, I, I kind of, uh, you embraced I it, I think pre- right off the yeah, hop. Embra- that's what I'm looking for. I embraced it. And like, yeah. I appreciated it because I, I had been proper parks for so long and I've been fighting and fighting and fighting for, for, for a job and for a contract and for an opportunity on television. And when I got it, I was like, you know, it was, just, it was like, it was like a badge of honor or something like that. It's like, Oh, you know, now my name is mm-hmm. Braxton Sutter and I'm going to make this work. And you know, I was, if anything, I was, I was actually really excited about it. To follow up with, with Ali, are you going to, or have you integrated aspects of that cherry bomb character that you identified with uh, presently into your character as Ali on impact? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially now that I'm I'm wrestling a lot more and I'm able to sort of do more in the ring. Um, a- absolutely. I mean, the aggressive, like for anybody that you know followed me on the indies, uh, Cherry Bomb, <laughs> I was a little more aggressive and a little bit nastier. <laughs> um, but it's been fun to sort of uh, add in that aggression in my matches um, that I wasn't able to do before. I, and I think, I think the character of Cherry Bomb was a lot more confident than Allie. Um, and it's been fun to sort of play with uh, Allie developing into having more confidence and having that little Cherry Bomb streak in her. So hopefully I'll, I'll be able to show a little bit more of that, that side eventually. And we're back. Braxton Suter and Allie, you can catch them every Thursday on Impact Wrestling. I see the poll results. Kudos, people. Kudos. I just want to (laughs) say, this is the time when I regret actually making friends in Toronto. Because I have a lot of friends in that area. Right, right. And it is like 100% pancakes in Canada. There are a lot of intelligent pancake lovers in this world, Sean. (laughs) I'm just telling you, if we took the Canadian vote out... Then Waffles would be winning. It was like 53, 47. I think that the Waffles still have a chance in the electoral vote. No, because if you take Kentucky out, then you get to lose a lot of Waffle votes too, Sean. It uh, goes really. both ways. Waffles are huge in, in America. I, I mean, I, I realize the whole chicken and waffle thing. Uh, chicken and waffles I've, are right? amazing. Yeah. And never chicken, had it. You never had chicken and waffles? I'm going to. I it's will. A, it's soon. a good combination. Yeah. And then you have like but, biscuits with it and gravy and stuff. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Gravy's not right? my deal. No? Really? No. Nope. Oh, it's good. It's good. But uh, yeah, crepes and pancakes win. And I'm glad that there's some still some intelligence left in this world. <laughs> Especially when I'm hearing stories like that Peter Rabbit thing about the allergy bullying and all this bullshit that you have to deal with this Hundreds day and age. Hundreds of votes. Hundreds of I actually votes. have a tree nut allergy, so I had to comment on that. Oh, did you? Yeah, it was great. Did you say I was also offended? Well, no. I, <laughs> it offends me that people are offended by this. Yes. What is that situation, the Peter Rabbit allergy offensive deal like what I, I haven't seen the movie but uh uh there's a group that was asking the studio to apologize because in a movie called peter rabbit that came out i guess last week there's a scene in which a child is bullied by other children over a food allergy <laughs> so a group wants the studio to apologize for that and i posted it on twitter and i said okay well i guess every studio better apologize for every movie ever made because every movie has a victim of in some capacity right Victim yeah. of something. Well, I would want the studio to apologize because that's a stupid plot point. Of all the things people have been bullied over, I don't think I have ever seen one say, like a kid say, LOL, you can't eat shellfish, you little bitch. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> Apparently what they did was they 
laced their food with whatever they were allergic to or something. Oh, okay. Something okay. like that. Was it even a kid, though? I what I heard I, was I, I, I don't know. the rabbits throw like a like berries at Donald Gleason because I have he's no trying idea. to kill them. Right, right. So I was Damn. basically like, look, if I ever make it my mission right. to kill a sentient family of rabbits. Right. And they throw are, tree nuts at you? Yeah, that's fair that game. That's perfectly acceptable. That is fair game. I am super excited to never follow up on this and find out what it actually was. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I agree. It's really dumb. Let's get to some, some uh, listener questions. Uh, I only wrote down three. If we have a little time, we can do some more. But first one is from Sam Wilson. He says, is WWE 2 wrestling driven? Um, so here's my opinion. I think that today, WWE's audience, I'd say two-thirds of them are internet-savvy wrestling fans. I think that... The resurgence that we're seeing in pro wrestling now, a lot of it is because of non-WWE wrestling, like Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling, which are wrestling-driven. And so I think that you need to not ignore that fan base. Uh, at the same time, though, I think that because WWE is the, the mainstream brand and they're in the public eye, they need to have character-driven stuff as well. They have to have a balance between the two. I think the Raw brand's done a good job of that now. They're, the, the Cena Miz match the other night was almost 20 minutes. But then at the same time, they have a segment with Braun Strowman you know, playing a double bass. So I feel like the Raw brand is doing a good job with it. I, a SmackDown, I think the Road Dog needs to needs to go get a job at a at a hot dog stand somewhere. But uh, Raw, I think they're doing a pretty good job. And again, I think uh, I think that they are uh, trying to cater to to both the hardcore fan base. Are you and trying the, to say that you want Road Dog to make a wiener stand? I said this before, and I'll say it again. He needs to get O U double T. Oh, you didn't know. I think that I'm with you on the wrestling driven thing. You gotta, the audience has changed. Times changed from the the 70s and the 80s to the 90s when people wanted the, all the fluff and all the extreme things. And now it's more of an audience that craves this. And ultimately, you do have to cater to the people that are paying for what you are putting out there. Like mm -hmm. that's the thing. You got to keep your customers happy. In that regard, you know, I'll have a bunch of people saying, oh, the ratings are lower, blah, blah, blah. WWE's making money hand over fist right now, so. The ratings are lower, but it's, it's also the, the landscape of the industry. It's not yeah. all WWE. And, and the way it used to be, going back many years, is the pay-per-views used to be where you got the long matches, right? So it used to be that Raw would be more about the storylines and the characters, and then the pay-per-view, they'd have the 20-minute matches. Now, because they have three hours to fill on Monday nights, because rights fees is their biggest revenue generator, and because the rest of the landscape's changed a little bit, they need to have some of these 15, 20-minute matches. And they got plenty of time to do it. It's not like they're, they're scrambling for time on Monday nights. This used right? to be one hour on Monday nights. Right. And then an hour of syndication on the weekends. That's I think it. there used to be three matches. If three that. matches, yeah. Yeah. If we were lucky, and one of them had a jobber from like right. Staten Island or something, like, <laughs> like yeah. Carmella's That's where they're dad all located. The That's where they're all located. Yeah, Carmella's dad. This next one is from Jesus Juarez, uh, and I was trying to find a quote from somebody on Twitter, and I couldn't find it. Maybe you know what it is. So he says, "Why is SmackDown focusing their time on stupid graphics rather than creative storylines?" Somebody posted it on Twitter last night. It feels like somebody on the SmackDown team just discovered the new animated uh, feature on PowerPoint because they were, they were forcing these stupid on-screen graphics. I don't know why they're doing it. I wish I knew. They're, they're not I doing it I wish I knew too, and I've, I've asked. I've tried to find out, and nobody yeah. seems to know. And a lot of the wrestlers like, don't even realize it because they're backstage and doing their own Cutting thing, and they don't, yeah. they don't really see it. Yep. It's weird. It's so weird. Like, why would you do that? Like, it's so stupid. I don't know. Maybe you're trying to appeal to, like, a younger demographic that I don't understand. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't make sense. I wish I knew why they were doing it. I Just... like to believe I have my finger on the pulse, but, my God, mm -hmm. I, I don't get that one. No. If anybody, if we got any teenagers that watch the show, maybe hit me up on Twitter. Let me know what is there's something I'm missing here. And, again, Raw doesn't do it. This is strictly a SmackDown thing. Well, they did a little bit with the Nerdometer. Yeah, well, they did a little bit, but then they would have some of the same exact pre-tapes about the Mixed Match Challenge. But on Raw, they wouldn't have the graphics, and on SmackDown, they would. The exact same clip. So, yeah, I don't get it. This next one is uh, from RV, uh, Mr. Promo. He says, do you think they should change the name Cruiserweight Division and call it Light Heavyweight Division and use the New Japan concept for that division in order to create more interest for 205 Live and make it feel more important? Um, I think RV brought up a good point. It actually made me think of an idea. And I want, to, I want to run this by you. So uh, now in New Japan, uh, I don't think they call it uh, light heavyweight. I think they call it the junior heavyweights, right? Uh, 
Yes. And the the weight limit's 220 pounds. And we've seen guys like Kenny Omega use the junior heavyweight division to springboard. So he'd start out as a junior heavyweight and then become a heavyweight after that. Um, some An idea that came to my head, do you remember the Super J Cup? I do. So they used to do an annual tournament called the Super J Cup. And years ago, it was well known that guys like the Dynamite Kid were in it when he was in his prime. Chris Benoit was in it as Pegasus Kid. Jericho was in it. Dean Malenko was in it. Eddie Guerrero was in it. They would take anybody that fit that weight limit. And in their case, they were going all over the world. And they were bringing guys and they were doing a, a one-night tournament. And I thought to myself, why doesn't WWE do an annual one-night tournament like the Super J Cup they could do it on the network as a special if they wanted to, just like how the Royal Rumble started out as a TV special. They could do it in March. The winner of that tournament gets a shot at, what do they call it, the Cruiserweight title or give it a new name, at WrestleMania. Well, they're, they're doing the Cruiserweight tournament right now for a shot at WrestleMania. But they're doing it now because they have to, because they lost Enzo Amore. Yeah. But what if they did it as an actual tournament? They, they use guys from the main roster... As, as some of the participants, these guys from NXT as some of the participants, maybe they could bring in a surprise or two, make them participants, and you do it in one night and the winner gets a shot at WrestleMania. That think, is what they're doing right now. <laughs> but again, they're doing it because they lost their champion. Yeah, they're not, I mean, I th- wish this they is, would do a lot of things. I think you should have a cruiserweight champion that you believe in, have a match with a top flight WWE champion and hang with him, maybe get beat, but hang with him. Lend some credibility to that division. And again, if you, if you lift the limit to 220, you've got more options in terms of using guys on the main roster that aren't doing anything. Well, I think that they moved it down for obvious reasons. Like when the cruiserweight limit was higher, there was some steroids. Back Scott Putsky. Remember that? Oh, yeah. He was a solid choice. Yeah. When, when, I mean, think about that. 225 pounds. That's a UFC heavyweight. Yeah. That's the highest weight class. Yeah. That's yeah. nuts. Yep. Somebody uh, asks, well, we already got the, the Braun Strowman thing. Will WrestleMania ever be held in the UK as we have Wembley Stadium that could host such a massive event? I think it would take a major crash in the North American market to do that. <laughs> but I wouldn't doubt that a SummerSlam or a another pay-per-view would be there. I don't know why they don't run another pay-per-view there. I mean, SummerSlam 92 was a big hit. We still talk about it to this day. They filled Wembley Stadium. I actually just watched the, uh, like a month ago, I saw the Bulldog Brett match again. And, and, and the crowd reaction was phenomenal. Obviously, because they like to make it a week-long thing, because they like to do a pre-show three or four hours in advance, and the time difference is going to make it a challenge. I know that in the case of the UFC, because the UFC is, is everywhere, they end up doing shows in, other, in areas across the pond at, like, what, noon local time is when they start? Yeah. They could, in theory, do that. I guess the question is, if you include the pre-show, are people in the UK going to want to go to the arena for, like, 10 a.m.? Yeah. That's the question, right? So if they're if they're willing to do that, they could fully they could fully do it. That's a long ass day if they're getting there at 10 a.m. and they're there until 5 6 p.m. potentially. But you know, got a couple more with Triple H taking over 205 Live. It instantly feels fresh and good again. How long before he gets the reins over SmackDown Live on Tuesdays as well? If at any point, not no, he not till should, should, should have been two years ago. <laughs> not till Vince steps down. Because they're still getting their rights fees. That's their biggest money maker. They're not going to pass that off until Vince steps down. What did you both think of the Jackal in the WWF in the late 90s? That is a random question. Andy, <laughs> WWE misused him. He was a great talker. I like some of Impact under his direction. And, yep. yeah, he is a great talker. I liked him as Cyrus the Virus in ECW more yep. than anything. He was really such a shit heel there, that guy. Uh, in WWF, I... I didn't get the character. He, yeah, he didn't, it didn't fit. I he, don't think. he was a heel that would... Remember, he wore a jewel on his forehead... Yes, I do. And he was a heel that would give a jewel to a girl at ringside and kiss her on the cheek like a baby face. He was managing guys in army fatigues, uh, whatever the hell they were called. Uh, truth the truth commission? commission. Right. So Ergon, he, Recon, and Sniper. Right. So he was managing guys in army fatigues. I didn't get the character. He was a great talker, but I didn't understand the character. It didn't, uh, didn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, Kurgan went on to be in, like, I think the movie 300 and... Recon and Sniper, one of them was Bull Buchanan. I'll tell you, I'll yeah. tell you an interesting Kurgan story. So you know that he's a, an actor now, right? Yeah, I just said he was in 300. You should listen to your own show. It would help. That's uh, because I'm too busy trying to think of my next thought, Sean. <laughs> yeah. That's why. So he, uh, there was a story one time. He was, at the, he was on the Toronto subway because he was filming a movie in Toronto. 
and he was taking the subway and he was standing on the, imagine Kurgan, whatever the hell his real name is, was standing on the platform and a journalist from one of the local newspapers happened to be taking the subway as well, recognized him, ended up striking up a conversation with him, got him to agree to do a story for the paper and invited him over to his house for dinner. Wow. All because he was always... standing on the platform going, going wherever. Always heard he was a nice dude. Yep. Uh, here's a fun fact. After WWF, uh, Mantar would eventually be in the Truth Commission. What? Yes. Yes. He was in the USWA version of the Truth Commission as Tank. Was he? Yeah. Interesting. A fun, fun fact for you. Fun fact for you guys. My full interview, well, almost my full interview with Raven is up on Fightful.com right now. You can head over to YouTube.com slash Fightful. Check that out. Tomorrow morning, if you're listening on Wednesday, but Thursday morning, the return of Wikipedia Fact Check. I've had a bunch in the can for like a year and just kind of accumulated them. Never had the time to put them together. It was it was really demanding and have one tomorrow with Muhammad Hassan. He won the vote. I'll probably run Colt Cabana next week. And in there, he tells a story where he was slated, told that he was slated to beat Batista for the WWE Championship. So check that out. Also, subscribe to our friends Pro Wrestling Unlimited on YouTube. You've seen some of our videos on their page, some of their videos on our page. Uh, a great uh, bit of cross-promotion we have with those guys. A lot of fun stuff. Also this weekend, Fightful alternate commentary for the Elimination Chamber 2006. Not the good one, though. It's the ECW Extreme Elimination Chamber. Ugh. I don't even remember that. I had never watched it before this. There's wow. going to be a lot of matches I watched for the first time <laughs> right. for these. Myself and Anna are going to be filming one with Hogan Warrior, then we're going to do the WrestleMania 2000 Hardcore Battle Royal and then the Raven Kane Big Show Hardcore title match for a couple of uh, WrestleMania-themed episodes. So uh, hit us up, Twitter, at Fightful Online. Follow us cross-platform. We're on Instagram and Facebook as well. Subscribe, like, thumbs up. Jimmy, what else you got this week? Anything? Uh, well, I still have a house rental going on, so as soon as we're done this, I'm literally going to head, head over to my new house. Doing that. Oh, man. Yep, doing Fancy. that. And uh, that's it, man. Valentine's Day tonight. Two little kids. It's any other day to me, man. So, <laughs> oh, I'm, me, and, me and my wife are going to sit home and eat pizza. With your six cats? And are you. <laughs> oh, are you well, uh, here's the. There's seven in here right now. We're trying to give one away. We took one in. Oh. Outside meowing in the rain. Did you give them all Valentine's Day cards this morning? No, they give me cards. They give you cards. <laughs> Is that one of those situations where, like, your wife writes them out and then says, like, you know, I love you, Daddy, and then each one of the cats gives it to you? Yes, 100%. It's like that. Okay, okay. I got it. Yes. I got it. My daughter... Guys, follow. We have that post-Raw show, that post-Smackdown show. We have <laughs> these shows all over the place. Jimmy Van, screwing up my life. <laughs> Till next time, guys, we're out.